Hello friends, it is really good to be with you today thinking through the important question, what is truth? I understand you had my colleague Max Jagannathan speak last week and this week, uh, unfortunately, he said that even though you just had two Australian accents previously, you do actually have another Australian accent. So we do apologize for that and maybe that links into our topic, what is truth? Detecting truth in a world filled with lies uh, because so often we can get misinformation uh, intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, and so we're going to be thinking on this subject and it's relevant for all of us because all of us want to know what is true and we want to shape our lives accordingly. Uh, I came to know God through Jesus when I was young. I'd been to church my whole life. I had a good experience of Christianity from my parents and so I, I was willing in a sense to investigate it to see if it could be true uh, for myself and objectively but I really felt this struggle when I was at university. I was studying chemical engineering. I was one of only a few Christians in my course of chemical engineers. And I remember thinking there are certainly reasons or benefits that I could find for getting rid of this Christianity thing, but I, I was convinced that I should embrace Christianity if it is in fact true not just if it's fashionable or not just if it's useful pragmatically, but if this thing is actually true, I was willing to kind of shape my life around that. And really, I was, for me, it came down to the person of Jesus. Is this guy trustworthy? And so I really dug into looking at the person of Jesus and, and looking at, yeah, philosophical and scientific things and do they support and work with the Christian worldview. Uh, and the great news about Christianity is I'm not just asking you to leave your brain at the door, uh, it opens itself up to investigation because God claims to be the author and source of all reality and therefore all truth is God's truth. And so I was willing to examine Christianity as an adult to see if it was actually true, not just good, and I hope you'd be willing to do the same. Now I've spent about the last 13, 14 years of my life examining the case for Christianity because it mattered to me personally, but I also thought, well, if this is true, it matters for others. They need to know this, not just what it is, but why it might be true and reasonable. And so I really was interested in the objections that people would throw at Christianity, the case against it. Uh, but I became intellectually convinced that Christianity was the most reasonable offer on the table, that it made, made most sense of reality and it gave a framework for meaning and purpose in life that it helped me deal with the suffering in my own life and others around me and in Christ I found a way of life that grounded my identity and gave me a future and hope for the future unlike anything else and so this question of what is truth it's not just some abstract philosophical discussion this matters for all of our lives I was speaking to a guy just a couple of days ago and he asked me, look, why was I into ministry? Why did I care to think about and put so much time into these big questions? And I said, look, I wanted to know what was true. And he found that to be a satisfactory answer because we all care about truth. Uh, our ministry's late founder, Ravi Zacharias, uh, says we have the right to believe whatever we want, but not everything we believe is right. And so this question is relevant for all of us. And so I want us to camp out a little bit in John's Gospel because John's Gospel has truth as a mega theme. It talks about it all the time. And I was really helped in my thinking on this subject as I read through John's Gospel and I saw it coming up again and again and again. And I found that this truth wasn't just an idea, but that it was you come to know it in a person. And so uh, it must be said on this enormous, th this is an enormous topic. And so anything that I share today, I won't be able to fully unpack or give full justification for because we've just got limited time, but we can go over some really big ideas. So first big idea that I think is essential is that truth exists and it matters. Uh, in John chapter 18, verse 37 to 38, there's this Fascinating little exchange between Jesus and Pontius Pilate, who's the Roman procurator overseeing his trial. And in verse 37, Pilate says, you are a king. And Jesus answers, you say I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? 
retorted Pilot. And it's an astonishing claim. The reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Uh, and anyone who cares about truth on the side of truth will listen to me. See, notice there that Jesus just assumes that truth is a real category. I mean, today there's this narrative going on that tends to suggest that pursuing truth is pointless because we can't really know it, we can't have access to it, and it's even dangerous to think you have the truth. And so someone may say something like, well, look, there's no such thing as truth. But let's just examine that for a second. If someone says there's no such thing as truth, you need to ask them, is that true? See, if it's true that there is no such thing as truth, then it's actually not true that there's no such thing as truth because you're asking us to believe one thing and disbelieve in one thing and believe in another at the same time. So it's, it's actually a flat out contradiction. One philosopher put it like this, if someone tells you that there is no such thing as truth, they're asking you not to believe them. They cut off the branch they're sitting on. And so here's the point. You cannot deny truth objectively without at the same time affirming its existence. And so Jesus is being perfectly reasonable here to speak about truth as a real category. And for most people throughout history, that's been self-evident. Yet perhaps even more astonishing than Jesus' claim that he speaks the truth, I think is Pilate's response. He's in conversation with the very one in whom all things are claimed to have been created, that he himself is the source of truth, and Pilate looks at him and he says, in keeping with his relativism and you know philosophizing, what is truth? And then he doesn't listen for a response. And see, it's a contemporary question being asked by Pilate, and in our culture, we're all quite skeptical about anyone claiming to have that kind of truth or authority. Uh, is truth out there? Can it be known? If it can be known, who knows it? There's no more important question because bound up in this question of what is true are questions of identity, meaning, purpose, who am I? What are we here for? Where are we going? See, we're meaning-seeking creatures. We don't just want what's comfortable and pragmatic, although we often live that way. We also want to know what's true. The entire film of The Matrix is built on that premise that people would rather live for some true and reality and real existence rather than just something that makes you feel good, even if you're losing comfort to know what is true. And so I do hope that today isn't merely philosophical, but it's illuminating in showing us the truth about God, not just ideas about God. The truth about God, but not just ideas about Him. And so I just want to pray for us really quickly that God's Spirit might do an illuminating work in our minds and our hearts. Dear Lord, please help us to understand what your Word is saying, uh, to make sense of reality, to have clear thinking, Lord, that we might be willing to uh, apply it, to hear it, Lord, and if we become convinced of it, to trust in it. We pray these things for your glory and our good. Amen. See, one of the reasons why our culture is so concerned about truth in the modern world is because we live in a bit of a point of tension between two ways of thinking, thinking about truth. There was one way of thinking that's been dominant for about 300 years, and it was basically, if you just put your mind to it and you think really hard, you'll get there. That actually, you will be able to reason your way to the truth. And so there was huge confidence in the capacity of human reason. And they thought, look, if we really put our thinking caps on, sooner or later we'll get there. Not just truth about details and mechanics, but we'll figure out the big questions. Capital T, truth, you could say. And so not just scientific observations, but people thought we can figure out reality itself. And so it produced, for quite a few generations, a time where people were actually very confident that they discovered the truth, but then there were arguments between people as to who had it. Uh, so it could be religion, or it could be communism, uh, fascism, materialism. And so people started to compete over what they believed to be true, and so we saw the awful realities of the 20th century 
unravel the horrors and compromises of Nazi Germany, of Soviet or Chinese communism, Western imperialism, and increasingly people lost faith in those capital T truths, those ways of defining and explaining reality as a whole that people claimed because it got us into a great mess. And so people stopped talking about big T truth and they, it, it became very small. It became something more private and subjective. And so maybe even it was reduced to some kind of empirical form of thinking that actually there's only a few small things we can prove mathematically. So actually the other truths that we live our lives by, they're more subjective, they're more personal. And so we speak very humbly it seems, of what is true for me. People use that kind of frame. But it's got the implication that what's true for you might be quite different, and that's okay. And so it's no longer our minds and reason that tells us what is true. It's intuition and feeling. And your intuitions and feelings are going to be different to mine, and and that's okay. We shouldn't judge one another. And so truth more recently has become narrowed in the way people thought. And it became much more self-effacing, more humble. People thought, well, you know, I don't want to say that this is right and you're wrong. And so I'll just say this is true for me. And so the result is that our generation is quite skeptical about truth. But at the same time, people are actually longing for it. So people are skeptical of others claiming to have it. But at the same time, we long for it. And so what do we do? Well, many people try to invest and find meaning in their own life through making up their own story for meaning or purpose or where they find significance. And so we end up becoming the hero of our story. And so the songs reflect this. The arts always reflect thinking. Sometimes it goes before, actually. But the songs say, you know, I did it my way, that I will survive. You've got to search for the hero inside yourself. And so what ends up happening Uh, is that people inject meaning into their life and they think, well, I'll be the hero. But then reality begins to bite because we realize actually we're not living up to our our own standards. We're not even um, consistent. And so we can't live out that reality. And our culture has a suspicion towards people claiming to have the truth. But at the same time, we long for it. I remember hearing a preacher, I believe it was Paul Washer, saying he would do university outreach talks in Spanish-speaking countries. And he would get up and he would say, I am a speaker of truth. And he said everyone would applaud and they would see that was really noble. And then he would say, and I've found the truth. Uh, He said that people would roll their eyes. They would become suspicious. They would tune out because... People have this automatic reaction to thinking, well, if someone claims to have the truth, there's an arrogance and a a lack of humility. So anyone that claims that doesn't by default have it. I even noticed on the website Pathios, which is the largest uh, website in the English-speaking world about religious issues, uh, although they define themselves as progressive, secular, and humanist, so they don't believe in the supernatural, um, but they say that it is their goal to investigate the human condition in search of truth. So they don't say that we have it, at least they don't say that explicitly, but they say we're in search of truth. But that's fascinating because actually the whole website is constantly putting up information that's saying we, we know the truth and the truth is that there is no supernatural reality. And so it's a little bit inconsistent that we see people in one sense nervous about saying they have the truth and at the same time living their lives on foundations that claim to know something about reality. And so maybe we're nervous about claiming that we have the truth. So our culture doesn't say truth doesn't exist, but that we can't really know it. So it's relative person to person. Now, some truth is relative, you have to say up front. I, I prefer chocolate ice cream to vanilla ice cream, and you might say, no, no, vanilla's better. That's not the kind of, of truth uh, which is up for debate here. Because what, what is being discussed when people speak about truth is not uh, whether there's subjective truths, preferences, but whether there is an ultimate truth that defines all of us, that's true for all of us. Can we know that truth? And so some people will go, well, maybe we can't, so we just need to relativize 
truth because it's all about our interpretation or reception of it. And so they say it might be true for you, but it's not true for me. And it sounds nice. It seems humble. Um, but it all what your the way you see reality always affects others. I once heard of a radio conversation held between a U.S. naval ship with Canadian authorities off the coast of Newfoundland in October 1995, and the Americans, upon noticing that they were heading for a collision with the Canadians, sent a signal to them, and here's the transcript. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Canadians, recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. Americans, this is the captain of the US Navy ship. I say divert your course. Canadians, no, I say again, you divert, you divert your course. Americans, this is the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic Fleet. We're accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. I demand you change your course 15 degrees north. That's one five degrees north, or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of this ship. Canadians, this is a lighthouse. Your call. And so what that little story shows us is that if it is absolutely true that truth is relative, then that statement that truth is relative um, is itself relative and therefore not absolute. See, if it's relatively true that all truth is relative, then that statement is just pointless. Uh, you wouldn't even bother saying anything. So you always look for a point of reference whenever we make statements about reality. And so the reason we laugh at that story is because we know deep down and intuitively that even though we might disagree on what truth is, we all know that there is truth. And so while there's all these narratives around us, like truth is, re is relative, reality has a way of interrupting our false ideas about the world. And so whenever you deny the existence of truth, you have to affirm it at the same time. So we actually can't escape it. Now, I know that's been kind of a lot of heavy discussion philosophically. There's a little bit more and then really we'll get into the scriptures in our lives personally. But once we've established these big questions, it's important that we, we test, we put these uh, questions to the test for truth. And so we look at logical consistency, we look at empirical adequacy, and we look at experiential relevance. And so science, as a means of investigation and discovering things, that fits under the empirical adequacy thing. And so to expect it to cover all of those bases, that it covers logic and experience as well, uh, is actually leaving you with a, a smaller scope of investigation. Uh, and I would say not just uh, intellectually uh, reduced, but it's unlivable. And so one of the lies that we've brought into, in our culture at least, is that the only evidence that has value is scientific evidence. So you might have heard your, your friend say, or even you might say this yourself, that I only believe what science can prove. The only truth and reality which exists is that which be, can, can be discovered through the natural sciences. And so the challenge is, well, can you put God under the microscope? Could you make him the object of empirical inquiry? Can you bottle him up in a lab? Could you conduct a repeatable experiment? Could you test God's existence? And you can't do that. You can't do it in the same way that you at least test the gravity hypothesis because God is not in the realm of the natural sciences. God is spirit and so therefore not he's not a being which can be empirically analyzed in at least the scientific method. And so this thought of th this this sort of thinking actually goes back to David Hume where he famously said this. You might have it up there on a slide. If we take in our hand any volume of divinity or school metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? No. Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. 
Now, I just want to consider that statement for a second. Is there anything wrong with what David Hume said there? Well, if you actually check it out and you look at its assumptions and analyze it for more than five seconds, you'll see there is. It fails its own test. Just think about this. Is it a statement of science? No, it's not. There's nothing within this that contains any experimental reasoning. So according to Hume's own rule, what should we do? Commit it then to the flames, for it can be nothing but sophistry and illusion. See, I believe philosophy and science are best done in a complementary way, not a competitive way. And so rather than being reductionistic and thinking the only thing that matters is some kind of empirical reasoning, uh, we actually need to have a wider scope for gathering evidence. And there's different kinds of evidence. And so people, they rejected this big T truth because they were nervous about the effects that it could have on people, the dominating effect. And we know the limits of our mind, right? Our reason alone doesn't always answer the questions we have. We, we actually need more than just thinking. And it's into that context that John's gospel speaks. And it's profoundly relevant because it's a gospel that knows and understands the brokenness of our world. It understands the limits of human reason. It gets that intuition alone doesn't lead us to truth, that human nature isn't just good, good, good through and through and only getting better. But actually, it's a truth that comes from outside of ourselves. It doesn't begin with us that we're not the source of truth, that we didn't reason ourselves to it. And so that's why John's Gospel is really good news for us, because it grounds truth in God as the source of reality, and then it explains how Jesus came full of grace and truth. And so John chapter 1, verse 1 to 18, it tells a story, and it's a true story. You might say it is the true story that every one of us fits into, but it's not one that dominates or oppresses us like the stories we've seen in the 20th century. And so John chapter 1 starts with these amazing words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So it's a bit of an echo back to Genesis 1.1, and it's a challenge to our usual way of thinking because the old way of thinking is that we can just reason ourselves to truth. I can understand it through our mind. But then the postmodern thinking goes, well, no, not just reason, but actually we can figure out a truth for ourselves through intuition. But in both instances, truth begins with us. It's either in our minds or it's in our intuition. But in John's gospel, he says, no, no, truth and reality doesn't begin with us. It begins with God. And so the Bible has a completely different starting point for defining reality. It says, in the beginning, God. There's no philosophical justification to try and prove God's existence. It's just a statement, in the beginning, God. And it then says, in the beginning was the Word. And so with God is, is this Word. And it's a fascinating description or use of the second person of the Trinity because it says that truth, logos, reason, the word, it's not just a philosophical theory. It's not a mathematical equation. It's not something you can empirically analyze. Truth is a person, personal and relational. See, the word of God as a person is not reliant on our thinking it's not reliant on our reason. It's not reliant on our intuition. But this word of God, the second person of the Trinity, is the source of reality itself. In the beginning was the word. And all things came to be through him. Without him, nothing was made that has been made, the text says. And so it grounds reality in God. And so there's, there's troubles if we always try and define reality apart from God. In fact, the Greek word for, for truth, aletheia, also translates as reality. And so the passage states that, look, God is a reality, and through him came everything that was made. We're not at the center. God makes us out of nothing. And so science wonderfully explains the mechanisms of this world, the how questions. But it certainly can't explain the meaning of this world, the why questions. And so that's why if we only look at the mechanisms, we don't think about the agency behind it. If we don't 
spring our scope for gathering evidence wider. We're going to struggle to make sense of this life. And so the atheist is bound to say that all that exists is the product of impersonal time plus chance plus matter. And so the impersonal eventually gave rise to the personal. But on Christianity, John's Gospel here explains, actually, no, no, ultimate reality is not material. It's spiritual and relational. It's spiritual and relational. I was in Taiwan last year and I asked a group of uh, year 11 girls in a class what was the most important thing in their lives. I asked them to write it down on a piece of paper. Don't show it to anyone. We collect them up. Uh, we, we look at them to think about the big questions. What is the most important thing in life? And as we gathered them up, I quickly looked at them, and it was a small class, maybe 20, 25, but every single response was the same. There was a common thread throughout all of these responses. You know what they were? The most important thing in life was relational. It was either family, some friendship, a boyfriend or a girlfriend. See, there was this intuitive and instinctive impulse in every person to know that reality is not just uh, time plus chance plus matter, but that reality is actually relational. And see, on Christianity, reality is relational because it flows out of the nature and character of God. He's not a lonely, detached, impersonal ghost, but God is a relational being. That he has existed forever, Father, Son, and Spirit throughout all eternity. And so that means that we ground truth in relational concepts. We're not actually just going, no, no, this is something that matter produces. Uh, matter didn't give rise to mind, but a mind gave rise to matter. And so on atheism, the relationships that we have, they're just accidental and incidental. But on Christianity... Relationships are intentioned, and it's at the very heart of reality. And so God exists as a reality that doesn't try to prove himself via the tools of verification and empiricism that we'd be used to. He's not trying to, the scriptures aren't trying to argue for God's existence uh, philosophically, but rather it starts with God as the ground of reality. And the good news for us is that John's Gospel says that this God doesn't stay far off and just tell us things about himself so that we can investigate and find out. But that this God enters in. And so that's the next thing. Not only there is truth, but the truth can be known. It says in verse 9 of chapter 1, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. See, this uh, source of life, and truth, uh, illuminating light on this world, was coming into the world. And that means that it's not our job to purely figure out what is the source of ultimate reality, but that is our responsibility to receive it. But one of the things that verse 10 says is that the world didn't recognize him. So there is a blockage there. So just imagine uh, that you were born with a number of other people inside a, a large room. Uh, there's a door, but, but no one's going in and out. And uh, there's, there's no windows, people can't see out. Um, but, you know, there's libraries, people are learning and they're discussing things. And, but no one's ever been outside this room. And so they're discussing what is ultimate reality. What's outside this room? So there's an army captain. Uh, there's a structural engineer and an English teacher. And everyone's discussing what's outside this room. And the uh, structural engineer, very confident in powers of reason, says, oh, look, I've done my tests, and these are load-bearing walls. Uh, so I, I deduce that uh, we're actually in a skyscraper. We're in a large metropolis. We're actually in the middle of a large city. There's lots going on outside of here. Uh, there's a whole world in there. There's extra people. There's extra buildings. Uh, that's what I can calculate. The army captain looks at him and goes, don't be such an idiot. Uh, we've never been outside this room. We've never seen anything outside this room. We've never felt, touched, or smelt anything outside this room. Clearly, there's nothing outside this room. And then the English teacher looks at them both, and she says, you know, you're both so cerebral. 
you, you think that you can figure this out just through your mind or through observation, but, but uh, I, I just feel like there's something outside this room. You know, I believe there's, there's rivers and there's people walking along and there's even puppy dogs and butterflies or whatever. I, I just feel like there's more. And people are around discussing it. And as they're discussing it, the door opens and someone walks in the room and says, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they say, well, we're discussing what's outside this room. What more is there? And he says, well, I've, I've just come from outside. I can tell you. Now, you wouldn't look at that person and say, how arrogant are you to think that you can dare tell me what more there is? Because actually, someone from the outside is in a position to tell us. And so I, I think that one of the greatest lies that we are currently living in the midst of is this materialistic, secularistic, secular way of thinking that material reality is all that there is. And that anything else... It has to be a private position you hold, and it must just be kept personal. So it's a personal thing that you believe, and therefore it's private. You don't share it with others. And therefore, in a secular culture, you can theorize about something outside the world, but and you can maybe let it shape your personal life, but you, you must keep that out of public life. You see, what it does is it treats the, the supernatural uh, like something that you, you live without, that you live every day just in material existence. You can speculate on spiritual things, but you don't let them inform your material life. But for many people, that secular way of thinking that the only thing that there is is, is matter, it's like the person who has, who's lost their wallet. They're looking for their wallet, but they're only looking for their wallet at nighttime under the streetlight. They're only looking under the streetlight because, well, that's where the light is. And so they neglect to see that there could be actually many other areas for discovery, but no, no, this is where the light is, so this is where I'll find it. And that's the way materialists act. They think, well, this is my realm of investigation, therefore I don't look beyond it. Uh, the famous American TV host and interviewer Larry King, who was interestingly from an Orthodox Jewish family, he said of all the people that he wished that he could have interviewed to gather evidence, to, he was interested in people, he said he wished he could have interviewed Jesus the most. And he said the one question that he would have loved to have asked Jesus is, are you virgin born? And when he was asked why he would ask that question, he, says, he said, because if he's virgin born, then everything changes. And Larry King's absolutely right, but you don't need to wait for an interview with Jesus to know confidently that he's virgin born because he backed it up with an extraordinary life. Uh, the ripples of which have changed the world ever since. Those who came to know him for themselves were never quite the same again. Not just his life, but also his public execution, uh, his burial, his death, and then his, his resurrection demonstrating that he is not only the, the source of life, but his power over sin and death, and one who we can have confidence in. And so people who saw this witnessed to it. They kept talking about this. They gave testimony to this. And so people think, well, is testimony a reliable means? Can you learn truth through testimony? Now, an Australian philosopher, uh, Co Tony Cody, did some really in-depth scholarly work on this subject, which is epistemology, which is how you know what you know. And he concluded and he demonstrated that the vast majority of what we know actually comes from testimony, from what other people tell us. And it's not just the volume of what we know, that a lot of it comes from what people tell us, but actually it's a reliable means of learning things. He, said, he estimates that 99% of the time people tell the truth because it's just necessary to function in reality to be speaking the truth. Even pathological liars tell the truth majority of the time, their selective line. And so we have ways of testing testimony subconsciously. Uh, we, we don't believe all the things that we know just based on empirical study. So we all believe that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Now most of us, I assume, haven't done the test, haven't empirically got a thermometer and a Bunsen burner and boiled the water for ourselves to actually test this out. 
but we believe it based on the testimony of others through written and verbal means because we don't have reason to doubt. And so if testimony is not only a common means of telling important information, but also a reliable means of transmitting information, not, not infallible, but reliable, then it doesn't seem unreasonable for God to use that means, testimony, to tell us about himself, to disclose what he is like. And that's what Jesus said he came to do. He came to bear witness to the truth. And so truth can be known because it's been revealed to our world in the person of Christ. So truth exists. And then truth can be known because Christ brought it to our world that he himself was that truth embodied. He didn't just say that he came to testify truth. He did come to that, but that he himself was the truth in John 14, 6. And so coming to know God and coming to know truth, it's not like solving an equation. It's personal. But the fact that it's personal and relational, it doesn't mean that it's not reasonable. And so we don't know everything fully that there is to know about God in reality, but we can know it truly. And if we come to know Jesus, we actually come to know God truly. So for us to get to know each other relationally, there needs to be some kind of self-disclosure. You need to be willing to reveal something about yourself. So I've got a brother called David, uh, who I'm quite sure none of you have ever met. And you might be able to do some deduction to determine that he's male. Uh, you might use your deductive powers to think, well, he's related to Jordan, so he might be you know, really intelligent or good looking, or you might think the opposite, that he's related to Jordan, so he's not intelligent and not <laughs> good looking. Uh, I'm not sure what way you'd lean, um, but if you really want to get to know David, uh, actually, he needs to disclose something of himself to you. That actually, the best way that you can get to know him is that you meet him, that, that he makes himself known. And that is one of the staggering things that John chapter 1 verse 18 claims about God through Jesus. No one has seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made himself known. 27 times in John's Gospel, Jesus says, I tell you, the truth. And it doesn't sound like a humble claim to us. You know, people can say, oh, I have the truth, and that's generally okay. But for someone to say, I am the truth, well, that's something that if someone's backing it up with a life, it deserves some kind of investigation. And so that, that would be the thing that I would encourage, is that not just to see that Jesus is a source of truth, but to actually get to know him, to investigate him. But this is the third thing, and this is the saddest part, I believe, in John's Gospel, and I think in one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture, is that it says in verse 11, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. See, Jesus not only came to reveal truth to us, but also to save us from our sin. This impulse in us, which actually suppresses the truth about God. It suppresses it and it also rejects it. That's our default way of operating because of sin. And so while attending St. Ebbs in Oxford, I heard this story from Warden Roberts to illustrate this point. He told the story about a father in America who had a son during the Great Depression. And he doted on this son. He loved this son. He gave him everything he could, but he wasn't very wealthy. He didn't have very much. And so he wanted his son to have a better life. He wanted to give him an opportunity. So he scraped together all his savings. And he bought him a train ticket for a nearby town so that this son could go off and, and perhaps get an opportunity, get an education, do better for himself than his father did. And so the son went and he kept writing to him and they kept in some communication. But eventually the letters stopped coming back. They dried up and the father got really concerned and he, he thought, I've got to go find out what's happening to my son. And eventually he got this money together and he got a train ticket for himself. And he went to the town and went looking for his son. And he had a photograph and he showed people saying, has anyone seen my son? And eventually someone sees the photo and says, oh yeah, I know him. Oh, he's done very well for himself. He's got a nice big house over on such and such a street. And so the father gets himself ready. He's very nervous, also very excited to go and see his son again. 
And so he goes over to this house and he can hear this party going on. But he, but he knocks on the door and the door opens and there's this large room, this great party celebration going on. And he comes on in and he's looking for his son and he sees his son over in the corner of the room. And he walks over to him and he says, my son. He's so excited to see him and to be reconnected with him. And his son kind of looks him up and down, his dad, uh, his poor dad in his kind of country clothes and his country accent. And he thought to himself, what's he doing here? Oh, he's going to cramp my style. He's, he's going to embarrass me in front of my friends. I don't want to be associated with him. And so he thinks he's going to get in my way. I need to get rid of him. And so he says to his friends, I don't, I don't know this man. Can you please show him to the door? I've never seen him before in my life. And the dad was taken to the door and the door was slammed in his face. And you might think to yourself, well, I haven't done that to God. And maybe you haven't done it kind of consciously like that. You might acknowledge God's existence. So you might even say you believe in him. But by nature, none of us actually want God close because we're worried that he, he's going to cramp our style. He's going to give us instructions on how we're meant to live, on how we're meant to use this life. If God comes close, he demands our allegiance. And so we instinctively, by nature, we do what they did in the very first century. We want to get rid of this. This truth is uncomfortable and so the truth is rejected by the world. There is truth. It starts with God. This truth's come into this world. But this truth is rejected by the world. But there is hope for us. Verse 12 says this. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, but born of God. See, truth isn't just something we reason to. It's not something that we create. It's something we discover because Jesus came into our world. But it's freeing and liberating because even though all of us have by default rejected this truth, we've rejected this God, actually, this God, this truth, is full of grace and truth. See, that's what verse 14 says that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we've seen His glory, glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, this truth is not just a truth that crushes or oppresses. This is a truth that liberates. So Ben Shapiro is known for saying the phrase quite frequently. I don't know if it originated with him. Facts don't care about your feelings. Some of you may have heard that. You might appreciate that. Now, that might very well be true, but Jesus does care about your feelings. See, this isn't a truth which oppresses and dominates. This is the one full of grace and truth. And God's grace, it's his way of loving us. It's his unmerited, undeserved favor from himself towards people who have rejected him. And that's good news because we don't deserve that love. And so since Jesus himself is the truth, we can not only know the truth, but because he is gracious, God draws us in. He, he deals with our rebellious inclination. He deals with the impulse we have to suppress truth. And therefore, you can know truth through, through Christ. And the, the spirit, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, does a work of illuminating our hearts and showing us who Christ is but also dealing with our nature that's trying to push against and reject this. And so Jesus is the only one qualified to show us this ultimate truth and reality because he's, he's come from outside this room. He's stepped into the inside. And he doesn't just come to show us what God's like. He comes to deal with the barrier between us and God. He comes to deal with our sin. And that's why he says, in John 8 later on, that everyone who sins is a slave to sin, but if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. There was a, a doctor called Dr. Matthew Laquia who came to the attention of the world during an outbreak of the Ebola virus in Uganda in the year 2000. 
and he was a tropical medicine specialist who was called to a hospital to investigate uh, an unknown outbreak of a, it was an unexplained disease. And after investigation, this highly trained and skilled man, he diagnosed it to be the deadly and highly contagious Ebola virus. And it was the first time that the virus had reached a heavily populated area with links to the wider world. And so Dr. Luquia implemented the correct quarantine procedures to isolate the virus. And he and a small team remained to care for and treat those who had contracted the virus. And one night, while he was treating a badly vomiting and bleeding patient, he became contaminated and he died six days later. And in the actions of this remarkable man, we see a kind of love that was willing to care for those people who were afflicted because he was the only one qualified to do so. He was the only one with the skills and the knowledge necessary. And in the same way, Jesus was the only one qualified to deal with our sin. He, 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 we couldn't do it. Our mates, our friends couldn't do it for us. But Jesus was willing to come and deal with our sin because the issue between us and God, between ultimate reality found in God, between us and truth is our sin. And the consequence of sin is that we're separated from God, that we don't have access to eternal life. We are actually bound in sin, which leads to death. And so if you snap a tree branch off a tree, it might still look alive for a little while, but actually it's separated from the source of life and it will die. And so sin puts us in debt. And if you're in debt and I'm in debt, we, we can't help each other. The only person who can help us is someone in credit. And Jesus Christ was the only one who himself wasn't a slave to sin. And so he's in a position to help us. And he wasn't just qualified to help us. He was willing to help us. He was willing to take the effects of sin on himself. He went to the cross for us to deal with the the punishment and penalty of sin. So he got what we deserved so that we could get what he deserved. So there is great hope here in our world in knowing truth because the truth exists. It's found in God and ultimate reality. The truth comes into this world and our inclination to suppress or, or reject the truth is dealt with by God's grace and his spirit making it accessible to us. But we still have responsibility and our responsibility is to believe in him. And belief in John's gospel doesn't mean just agreeing with the facts. It means trusting in him. It means submitting to him. So if you say you trust in Jesus, but you don't submit to him, you don't obey him, that's not real trust. Because belief is behavior shaping, sure, but behavior is belief revealing. So real trust in Christ, something that the Spirit helps, it brings about this new birth that the Holy Spirit brings about as we place our faith and trust in Christ, that is something that brings a freedom, a freedom from sin. And so that's the very essence of eternal life in John's gospel. It's, it's freedom from sin to know God. To, to know God is what eternal life is defined as in John's gospel. John 17, 3, this is eternal life, Jesus says, they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. See, so do you know God? Do you know him personally or do you just know about him? You, you, you get the theory, you get the, on, the concept, you get the idea, but you don't actually have a personal relationship of trust with God. You don't find your meaning and satisfaction in life through him. You find it through the opinion of others or through your success at work or maybe through material things, or maybe through the pursuit of pleasure. But Jesus says true freedom is found in him. It's not just knowing true things. He says, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And he calls himself the truth. So knowing things doesn't set us free. The son of God sets us free, who is himself the truth. And this is how I want to finish. In John's gospel, belief is not just a matter of the evidence. It's a matter of the will. Do you want to know God personally? Do you want to have a relationship with him? Do you want life with God? Eternal life is not good because you get to be in heaven as a place. The great thing about heaven is not the place. The great thing about heaven is God. And if you don't love God, you won't love heaven. That's eternal life in John's gospel is knowing God, having a true relationship with him. And so are you willing 
to investigate Jesus, to see if he's the real deal, to see if he's someone you could trust in. Because if you're willing, he, he makes himself known. And you can read God's word. You can read the scriptures. And the spirit of God takes the word of God and it applies it to our hearts and lives. And so we need that change. Uh, we need hope. We, we need freedom from sin because otherwise, Jesus says, we're slaves to it. And we don't just need it for ourselves. We also need to extend it to others. And so to finish, John Stott says insightfully, our love grows soft if it isn't strengthened by truth. And our truth grows hard if it is not softened by love. See, the good news is that the good news of the gospel is that even though we weren't looking for God, he came to that which was his own and he came looking for us and that he made it possible for us to become sons and daughters of God. The spirit of God illuminates the word of God so that we might become the sons and daughters of God. I hope that you'll do that and that you'll find meaning and purpose and truth and security in the person of Jesus, not just in ideas, but coming to know God personally.